can you hear me now? All right, so I got to speak a little bit loud. There we go. All right. Uh, thanks for the intro. The, uh, that, uh, that chief of staff stratcom thing always gets, uh, throws people. Um, if, you, if you listen to it, it always throws me. I go, I don't, I don't remember ever having that job. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I do want to thank uh, FCA Hawaii, 31 years going strong. I met a plank owner this morning. I'm sure there's more in here. But I appreciate uh, you inviting me out. And of course, Admiral Mackey, uh, the invitation is always appreciative, uh, appreciated. And uh, I significantly and sincerely appreciate your mentorship. Because I asked, I said, hey, you know, la I spoke last year, and I have about five minutes worth of cyber knowledge in my brain, which I dumped to everybody last year. I said, so what can I possibly talk to this crowd about this year? <clears throat> and the, uh, the great mentor that he is, he said, just don't go long and don't be boring. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, well, you know, if you bat 500, you make a lot of money. So uh, we'll see how I do. Uh, and I guess I, uh, I stand up here as part of my first step in the 12-step process. And I say, I am not a cy cyber caveman, but I am a cyber preschooler. And I'm, the reason I'm a preschooler is because I use technology, smartphones, electronic ignition, uh, iPad, iPod, you name it, I've got those. But other than that, I really am a preschooler when it comes to the cyber world. I don't understand the language. It really is, to a large degree, foreign to me. Uh, I'm a tactile person. I like the pages of a book. I have an e-reader now, by the way. But I like, I am tactile. I like, to see the, I like to see the engine. I like to see the pump. I like to see those things working inside it. I understand that much, much better than I understand what the cloud is or all the other stuff that you guys are going to probably go through in the next couple of, uh, next couple of days. Um, so I, I asked myself, why is it that I am up here talking to you as a, uh, to, to open up the conference? And I think it really does come down to the, uh, to the, to the theme of the conference, and that is maximizing combat power. Uh, my job absolutely relies on what people like you, you and people like you, do. I mean, truth of the matter is, nowadays, I can't do my job without the things, the technology that, has, that we have produced. But I'd also submit that you can't do your job properly without understanding my side of the business. And so I think uh, it's, it's the combination of the two that makes sense of why I'm here kind of opening up their, your conference. Uh, yeah, I brought this thing up here. I said, yeah, let me click. And then the first thing I do is I leave the clicker over here. Okay, let's see. So just before this slide, not shown, I don't think. Yeah, just, be, just after this slide and just before this slide, <laughs> you would see, envision in your mind, the cover of the Navy's design for maintaining maritime superiority. Document was put out at the beginning of the year. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it remains the North Star for the Navy. It's the direction that we go, that we're, we're leading ourselves and we're pushing forward on. And the cover of that document, the design, is quite interesting. It shows Navy ships sailing in a, you know, on the great blue ocean, but more importantly, overlaid on it are a bunch of ones and zeros. And uh, when I first saw it, I thought, man, what, what, what is this kind of drawn to us? What, why, uh, why is this the cover of our Navy design? And uh, 
uh, as you read through the Navy design, it becomes, uh, becomes apparent. Because in there, we talk about three major global forces that are at play, no matter what the security environment, no matter what the strategic environment is. And, I, and you can guess what I'm going to talk about the strategic environment is. But uh, those three major global forces that are interrelated in all we do is, first of all, is maritime traffic and the significant increase on, in, and below the world's oceans, both military and commercial. It's phenomenal. The, uh, and because of that very, very large increase, we have we are stressing those waterways. We're using them much, much more, and they're becoming more and more contested. And these are the common waterways, common to all, international waterways, if you will. The second global truth uh, force that is that, uh, articulated in the uh, design uh, is the uh, rapid increase in the rate of technologi technological change. Right? I mean, uh, certainly this crowd knows it as well as, as probably any American, any citizen of the world understands you know, the, the massive changes uh, that we're seeing in technology. The third is the increase in the global information system, okay? the cyber domain. You know, it's kind of hard. I, I interlock both uh, the technological change and the, the global information system in my mind, uh, the preschooler mind that I have, uh, is, uh, is the cyber domain. And so the design says, talks about that these three are, are interlocked, and no matter what our challenges are, uh, we have to pay particular attention to these three issues. They will impact and affect everything we do and everything that others might do. And the global information system, the cyber domain, I mean, it's, it's abundantly clear of the huge, huge benefits it has brought us. Uh, and we talked about, already talked about smartphone, uh, iPhone, electronic ignition, all those things. But if you think about the flow, near seamless flow across time zones across the world of data, information, and knowledge. I mean, it truly is phenomenal. I can almost guarantee you, since I've been here at breakfast, I've got 50 emails and two of them are 10 megabyte files on there. There's no doubt in my mind. The data that we flow back and forth, uh, because we can, is quite enormous. We always, our discussion at the headquarters about this always is, hey, I don't want data. There are people that want data. It's not me. I don't have time for data. I'll take info, but really, info is not, I, I've got to do a lot to do with info to really turn it into the product that I want, and that is knowledge. And that's a challenge, because anybody who can just reply to all uh, and shoot out a bunch of stuff to everybody, um, it's a huge benefit, but it's, it does come with a little bit of a cost. Uh, the other thing I would say is that when we first brought the internet on and the global information systems way back when, uh, and as we, we were probably not as aware of the risks that were associated with this great new system, the, the, the uh, information systems. Um, I certainly wasn't, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, you do online banking, online credit cards, online, online, online. Uh, there, are, there are risks associated with the global information system. You know, clearly, certainly ask Sony, ask OPM. There's probably many more examples out there that once, uh, you know, this huge benefit came in, we probably didn't adequately recognize the risks, and they can be very, very consequential. And certainly, I mean, private industry knows this. I'd say the military, we're, we're a little bit slow on the uptake on, on some things, uh, but we have come around on this. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is 
with the advent of technology and information systems, cyber, uh, it's, uh, it's embedded in everything we do, from the tactical level unit, submarines, ships, aircraft, to the operational level, the way we conduct, uh, we, we run and uh, use our watch floor at uh, Pack Fleet, all the way to the strategic level. It's in everything we do, everything we touch, everything we work with. Uh, that's a huge benefit, but there are the risks associated with that. And so uh, oftentimes we think of this, uh, our, our ability to communicate and our technology, our information systems as an asymmetric advantage. And I think to a very, very large degree, it is an asymmetric advantage. It really, it's a temporal phase to this, uh, but it does, does depend where you sit, what your security environment is, whether it's a, an advantage to you or not. Uh, clearly, uh, what we're doing over in, uh, uh, with ISIL, against ISIL, uh, and in Syria, and that area, uh, it's a huge asymmetric advantage for us. There's no doubt about that. Um, that may not always be true, depending on who we're uh, actually uh, going against. Uh, the other area, the other thing that it's, because information systems and cyber is pervasive through everything we do, and, and I, I should say, that's a positive. Okay, don't take this wrong. That's a positive. Um, we have, uh, we've been a little, again, a little bit slow, but we are now moving cyber into uh, a warfare area. Uh, as, uh, as an example of that, and I should have, uh, say this, should have said this earlier, uh, any questions that come to me at the end, <clears throat> I may not be the, the smartest person around, but I'm smart enough to bring my expert, who's sitting right over there, my N6, Ruth, with me. And I've already told her, hey, when the questions come to me, the preschooler, I'm turning to the teacher. <laughs> but cyber is a warfare area. We're slow on the take for that, but we are moving in that direction. At Pack Fleet, we moved our N6 and our cyber organization in underneath our, our uh, Maritime Operations Center, our MOC. So it's kind of our operational arm of Pack Fleet. Uh, and uh, I tell you, I think that's a, uh, that's a cultural change as much as anything else. But it's a culture change that we want to inculcate. We want people to think of cyber as a warfare area, just like all the other warfare areas that we have. It's critically important, we think, as we go forward. But because we've been slow on the take, uh, there are, we've got some catching up to do. And uh, it's just not us. I think uh, the government as a whole, the, the world as a whole, probably has some of these same areas they need to catch up in. Um, think, of, think of doctrine, think of policy, and from my world, think of operational planning and where we are with cyber and in those areas. I mean, I'd ask you, what is a hostile intent in the cyber world? What's a hostile act? What's an act of war? What are our rules of engagement? You know, and there's a lot of smart people trying to think through these things. They're, uh, they're complex and they're complicated, uh, but we need to get that part figured out and we need to get it right. Because who knows, we may, as we speak, be at a non-kinetic cyber type of, type of war with state actors or non-state actors. It's just, it's, it's just much harder. I mean, I tell you, Sony, I bet you they, if, you know, if they were the, the military, they would have thought they were at war when they had their uh, attack. Um, so we have to think through those. Those are big policy issues, big doctrine issues uh, that, are, that the governments really have to solve. But we as a military, we have to look at it from the lens in which we look at things, and that's rules of engagement. So the design also talks about these strategic challenges. And uh, it's oftentimes referred to as four plus one. I'm going to quickly talk through these and then open up for questions. But recognize those three global forces I talked about, maritime traffic, 
global information system uh, they, uh, and technological change, they are pervasive across all four of these, all five of these. So four of these are state actors. That's Russia, starting from your left, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. And the last is a non-state actor, terrorism, terrorists in general, ISIL uh, more specifically. And uh, I was speaking uh, recently at, uh, at a city in our Midwest. And uh, I had a discussion on this, and, and one fellow raised his hand and said, hey, wait a minute, um, strategic challenges. Are you telling me these are our adversaries, our potential adversaries? And I said, well, um, let, me, let me put it a little different uh, terminology. I said, uh, there's, no, there's none of those state actors up there that want to go to war with the United States. There's not a single one of them. Um, and I think the likelihood of war with any one of those state actors is very, very low. It's not zero, but it's very, very low. Um, that said, 97% of the people in the United States have either homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance. And the reason that we have that is the same reason I have it. I don't think my house is going to burn down tomorrow or the next week or the next month. But nevertheless, I have fire insurance. Most of us do. Uh, and so think of us, the military, as your firemen. We don't think we're going to go to war. We know those guys don't want to go to war with us. But we're the insurance. And to continue the analogy, you never want the firemen, the first time they respond to a fire, to be your house. Right? You want them to practice. You want them to train. You want them to prepare. You want to look at them, look at all different ways that they're going to go fight that fire. So when your house is on fire, they're there, they put it out, and you get to save all those pictures. Whatever. Uh, and so that's what we are. We, we really are the firemen. Uh, we have to prepare, we have to plan, and we have to train. So hopefully we never go to a fire. But if a fire comes to us, we're ready to go put it out. Um, and of those four state actors, Again, I'm talking to a, a, a city in the Midwest. I'll say in the heartland of the United States. I said, uh, you should recognize in the Pacific Fleet, we've got three of those non-state three of those state actors that we're looking at every single day. Russia, China, and North Korea. Oftentimes, people focus on China and they think, uh, they think Ukraine, they think Europe, they think Crimea. Rightly so. Uh, there's a lot of work going on over there, a lot of issues going on over there. But Russia's on our side, too. Uh, and, uh, and so obviously China and North Korea, it's, people ask about North Korea. And, I, and they say, what do you think about North Korea? I say, hey, I, you know, you flip a coin. I, I'm not sure he knows what he's going to do tomorrow. Um, and so it's very, very unpredictable. If you've heard my big boss, Admiral Harris, talk, it's it's the most unpredictable actor uh, in the world, and certainly the thing that he puts a lot of time and effort into is, is thinking about North Korea. ISIL, or terrorists, we should recognize that there's two things. One, they're here in the Pacific already. Fairly large footprints. Okay? Philippines, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia and to a lesser degree, Malaysia, and probably other countries. We see and we hear about what's going on in Syria and ISIL, rightly so, but there's others. Uh, the other thing of, I think, a little bit of a concern is uh, eventually we're going to, we, uh, and this is a collective, we, we are going to take back over the territory that ISIL has. There's no doubt in my mind. Question is, 
where are they going to go? And they're going to go somewhere, right? Maybe North Africa. They may head uh, east. But they're going to go somewhere. They're going to reform. They're going to reconstitute. Uh, and then we're going to have to go after them again. So it's, uh, it's a problem throughout the world, and we, ought, we need to recognize it as such. Uh, let's see. So with that, let me, uh, let me close by just filling out, uh, let me do the clicker. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, I'm going to close with a couple thoughts. We, uh, we've had some discussions in our headquarters and with uh, some of the technical community with respect to um, uh, cyber issues that we've had and our concerns. And I, I've got five things I wanna, just want to list down here, throw out, and then, uh, then I'll open it for discussion. Um, from, from my preschooler type of mindset, I think we, you, need to better articulate what the cyber vulnerabilities are that we have. We've got them. We've got, we've got a lot of them. There's no doubt. But I need to better understand it. I need to understand if it's a, you know, a Cat 1 CAS rep, which I can just put in the books and fix much, much later, or if it's a Cat 4 that I need to fix it right now. Have to have a, a way of articulating that to us so that we understand because we don't understand your normal language. How big a vulnerability is it? I cannot fix them all. We don't have enough money to do that. I need to fix the important ones, log the others, and maybe over time start working on those. But we need to better articulate the vulnerabilities and where, really what it means to us. Uh, I talked about this at the last, last uh, year's AFCEA, software upgrades. I got to get better, got to get faster, and when I do it, I shouldn't have to recertify my entire, my entire system. Um, and I, I go back to my smartphone, and, and every now and then I get this little, uh, this little email from some, somebody somewhere that says, hey, you need to update good. And I'm like, okay, you know, push a button, make sure it's plugged in, push the button, wait a while, turn it back on, turn it off, whatever, and uh, it's up, it's good. And it's updated, and I'm out and operating again. Now, I'm not, uh, not naive enough to say, hey, you need to be able to do that for my combat systems on board my tactical units, because there's a lot more moving parts and there's more criticality. But we've got to get faster at, at not only updating it, when we decide it's an update, and then getting me back online. Third, um, finding new technology is not our issue. There's so much out there, it's feeling the new technology that's a challenge. And so um, I, did, I just passed that. We get a lot of folks that come by, and they really have some great stuff. Uh, and we're, it's just our, our challenge of being able to take your great ideas and your great stuff and actually field it for our tactical units. Uh, oftentimes, you'll hear talked about uh, assured C2, assured command and control. Put a little twist on that. Uh, some might say, you know, the, uh, the bad guy gets a vote, so you can actually not assure me C2. Okay? I believe that. And so what we talk about is resilient communications or resilient C2. Bad guys will try to degrade me, whether it's satellite communications or line of sight, whatever. They're going to try to degrade me. Uh, your challenge is, is recognize they're going to degrade us, and how do I gracefully degrade such that I still have some minimal ability to communicate at the tactical level and at the operational level. Tactical level is ship to ship, ship to CTF, and operational is the CTF back to uh, a headquarters like PAC fleet. And uh, so I'm a, I'm a submariner, and I know there's at least uh, at least one more in the room, and we, we kind of grew up with, uh, with uh, VLF. Every time I bring up VLF, very low frequency to people, I go, hey, show me who can jam it. You know, I, I've, got a, I've got a pretty good Brazilian communications with VLF. 
Problem is, baud rate is it's a little bit lower than, than, uh, than most people would like. But nevertheless, we have, to, we have to think about old stuff as we're going forward. Uh, and then lastly, and I know that this is going to be uh, uh, it'd be interesting to see how you guys think about this one, but it's not all about bandwidth. Okay? And I see these commercials on TV all the time, you know, get on and uh, get 500 megabytes per second and, uh, you know, how you, know, you can play games across the world seamlessly. Uh, and everybody's driving to bandwidth. I need bandwidth. I need bandwidth. Uh, and sure, uh, my wife loves bandwidth. Um, and, uh, and the stuff we do in our house, is, it's great. But that's not the world in which I live at, at sea, and particularly if I have to go to conflict. Um, I, and you ask why. Of course I'd love all the bandwidth in the world. But one, the other guy gets a vote on that. And two, you have to recognize that when I'm communicating, I am vulnerable. Right? It's a beacon of where I am. And so I need resilient communications. I need some amount of, uh, of bandwidth, but I'm not going to be out there becoming a beacon of light for a bad guy to, to come find me. Right? So it's not all about bandwidth. We call it counter ISR, how I stay hidden from the bad guy. Okay, so let me just close with, uh, I saw this morning uh, that the Army uh, was, uh, was starting up a, a kind of like a hack the Pentagon, a hackathon. And uh, are there any other folks in here that actually do that stuff? Legally do that stuff. Okay, well, so uh, I saw that and I thought I, this is the right group to tell it to. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. Absolutely wonderful. And they're going to start it up at the end of the month. So what I would tell you, and it's all, you know, illegal and, you know, once you, once you I, I think once you figure out a way in, uh, you know, SecDef gives you an award uh, and they, they have some little prize that, uh, that, that you show, hey, I was able to hack the Pentagon. So the Army's doing this. So what I would ask is that if indeed you're going to do that, the prize that you might want to show the SecDef or Secretary of the Army that you actually hacked them is the Army football team playbook. <laughs> but put it online first and then say, yes, we got in. Here it is. And so with that, go Navy beat Army. And I'll open up to any questions. Thank you, sir. First question, do you find our partners in the Pacific as interested in cyber technologies as the U.S.? And if so, are there particular type technologies of particular interest to them? Certainly yes on the first one. As a matter of fact, I just got a, uh, got a report, uh, I forget who, uh, who sent it to me, but the interesting part was it was talking about um, artificial intelligence and uh, compared it compared, unclass report, compared China and the United States. And it showed the amount of money Chinese industry, we, you know, which is oftentimes government backed, but Chinese industry was putting into artificial intelligence compared to U.S. industry. So it's, it's on page 33 of the report. I think it's actually a Goldman Sachs report, to tell you the truth. Uh, but the amount of money they are investing is phenomenal. Uh, and they've got a, uh, a system that is 97.5% accurate in face recognition, and they have some term for the face, but it's like, just like, it's like a crowd like this, and they scan through it, and it's 97.5% uh, correct in that, in that type of facial recognition. You know, that's phenomenal stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's unfortunately, it's, it's, you know, I look at this as a, well, it, so they're, they're putting a lot more money into those type of technologies than the United States is. Um, but if you look at you know, Japan, South Korea, I mean, they're phenomenal hotbeds of, of investing in technology, buying technology, 
and uh, you know, more is always better when it comes to that. I mean, I, I kid you not. Uh, you know, you figure out a good product and figure out a better marketing solution, and you're going to sell it. Um, and uh, we spent, uh, my wife and I have spent a considerable period of time in, in Japan, and we always uh, uh, are extremely interested in the, kind of the, the little gadgets that they produce. They've got something for everything. You may not even think you needed this thing, but man, once you see it, you go, how do I do without it? Um, so I, I don't know, you know, from a military standpoint, the, the technologies that, that everybody's looking at is uh, things that make our sensors longer range, communicate more easily between different sensors, and enable our weapons. Right, that's kind of what we're going. Uh, you know, it's uh, when you when you talk about technology and and uh, and how it advances the world. Uh, I've there's a book called Neptune's Inferno. I don't know if anybody's read it, um, but it's about the, the Battle of Guadalcanal, you know, the big first battle uh, of World War II, uh, where the Marines ended up hating the Navy because we put them ashore and then, then did not provide them the support that they needed uh, to you know, continue on in Guadalcanal. Now, it turned out, at the end, it turned out OK. We figured out our, our, the error of our ways, and now we remain hugging cousins with the Marines. But one of the things that came in and was first used in the Battle of, of uh, Guadalcanal, and there's a bunch of small naval skirmishes around Guadalcanal, um, was this thing called SG radar. Pretty, pretty new. It extended the ranges of our typical radar by about twofold. And so we were able to see the Japanese at about 10,000 yards, which is farther than the Japanese could see us. These are ships, right? And I look at that and go, 10,000 yards? I think I could see them that far away. But it's nighttime. Uh, and uh, it was decisive in several battles. And that's just, that's t it, the problem was, it was new technology, and the skippers, they didn't know how to use it. They didn't know how to employ it into their weapon systems, because it was just a radar. Uh, so it's, it's uh, the, the battle itself, the whole Guadalcanal is, is, uh, is an amazing story, but in particular, how, they, uh, uh, how we used SG radar uh, those who used it did very, very well. Those who didn't learned a little bit later. Uh, but so always, yes, uh, Asia Pacific countries are looking at technology. Next question. Thank you, sir. The next question is, do you feel like you are actually under cyber attack now? Oh, geez. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, so, you know, what's your definition of an attack? Um, is what I would say. My answer would be, yeah, I think we are. I, I think, I don't know if it's a state actor, I don't know if it's a non-state actor. Uh, it, it could be a, a high school kid in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I do think we are. I think whether it's a phishing attack, uh, uh, hack an online bank accounts. So I think we're under attack. Again, some of it is criminal activity. Some of it is non-state actor activity. And some of it is, is likely state actor activity. So yeah, I think I, I think uh, I think we're being attacked. Next question. Thank you, sir. We have time for one final question, yeah. and that is, how has your command changed your planning processes and products to account for cyber advantages and threats? Uh, I really can't talk about products. Um, the uh, You know, I, I talked that story about uh, we get a lot of data, data goes to info, info goes to knowledge. And I think, I think we've learned, probably just like all of you have learned, is that just because you can send stuff doesn't mean that everybody needs to get it. And we have to be as mindful about just pushing a bunch of info or data to people um, as not giving them anything. All right, there, there are two ends of the spectrum, and both of them are bad, in my opinion. Giving them nothing and giving them everything. 
Uh, I mean, truth of the matter is, uh, yeah, I tell you know, we, my guys all the time, you know, I get a lot of stuff that comes up. I get a lot of direct reports, and I say, hey, look, uh, tell me the bottom line up front. You know, is this, is this for my information only? You know, I may get to that tomorrow. Do I need to take action on this now? Put that right, put it in the, in the subject line of the email you're going to send me, or when you walk in the door, tell me, we've got an issue, we need to take action, here's what it is. Uh, because we need to, there's so much flowing, and there's so many things going on that we don't, I don't have time to uh, go through all the myriad of stuff that comes across my computer uh, to try to figure out, hey, what is this, what is this is really important to me right now that requires my action? Uh, and it takes discipline. You know, uh, I mean, it's, it, uh, uh, it, it, and it's a learned skill. Um, you know, we're, as you may, I'm sure everybody is aware that, you know, we have the, uh, the earthquake down off of New Zealand. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that for the last couple of days or so, uh, we've, been, we've been working that with, uh, with the New Zealand uh, folks their military, their, their government, uh, because as a friend, partner, ally, if you have a problem in this world, you know, we want to be someone you can rely on to go help. Uh, and so certainly New Zealand falls in that category. And uh, uh, so we're working very hard on that. But there's probably, I, I can't tell you how many, how many emails I got over the, over the, over the last, last day and a half on that. Uh, because we have some, uh, obviously, naval assets that can provide phenomenal support down there, and that's what we do. Uh, so there's a lot of chatter, but in something like this, I had to read through all the chatter, you know, to make sure I wasn't missing that one nugget that was built that said, hey, by the way, we need your P3 down there. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's not very efficient. Uh, but again, I think that's a discipline issue. It's a discipline on, on the people who are, who are pushing reply all or sending out information. So with that, I, uh, I thank you for your time and attention. Uh, and for those who are visiting to Hawaii, enjoy the islands, uh, and uh, uh, have a good conference for the next couple days. So thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Sawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Admiral Mackey to the stage to thank the Admiral on behalf of AFSIA. One more round of applause. Thank you, Admiral Sawyer. We will now.